Welcome everyone. My name is uh, Michael Noble and I'm the Executive Director at Fresh Energy. We're glad to have you join our web seminar on pollinators, climate change, and clean energy. Uh, Fresh Energy is a Minnesota-based clean energy and climate policy and advocacy organization uh, located in St. Paul, Minnesota. And we house and support the Center for Pollinators and Energy uh, here in St. Paul, a national initiative to support pollination and habitat as part of solar development. Uh, I'm uh, happy uh, to have really extraordinary speakers here today, and uh, I'll get an opportunity to introduce one of them later in the program. But I'm going to uh, first introduce my colleague and co-worker at Fresh Energy, Rob Davis. He is the uh, director of our Media and Innovation Lab, and he directs the pro project called uh, Pollinators and Energy. So with that, I'm turning over the program to Rob Davis. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be with you all this morning. Such a uh, fantastic day here where we're based in, in Minnesota, but I know that you all are around the country and around the world. It's my deep honor to introduce Dr. Marla Spivak. She's a MacArthur Fellow and McKnight Distinguished Professor in Entomology at the University of Minnesota. Her recent awards include the 2015 Minnesota Agri-Growth Distinguished Service Award, 2016 Steele Prize Laureate for Excellence in Agriculture, and the 2016 Wings World Quest Women's of Discovery Earth Award. She and her colleague, Gary Reuter, bred a line of honeybees, the Minnesota Hygienic Line, to defend themselves against diseases and parasitic mites. Current research includes studies of the benefits of plant resins to honeybees and the effects of agricultural landscapes and pesticides on bee health. Dr. Spivak's interest in bees began when she worked as a commercial beekeeper in New Mexico, and yet she still came to Minnesota. She obtained her PhD from the University of Kansas in 1989 on the identify, uh, identification of ecology in Africanized and European honeybees. Her TED talk on what's harming the honeybees and um, pollinator health has nearly 3 million views. I encourage you to go watch it after uh, this conversation today. And she answers her own phone. Thank goodness she did because uh, she really helped us out uh, five or six years ago now, uh, when we had a question about what could be growing under and around solar farms. Marla. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Oh, you have to stop sharing yours, Rob. OK, there we go. No problem. OK. Hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me, Rob. And um, I, I appreciate the chance to talk to everybody just briefly in broad terms about the importance of pollinators. And I'm hoping everybody can hear me all right. Rob, can you, I can see you right now. So I think we're yep. okay. Okay, good. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm at the University of Minnesota. I'm in the Department of Entomology. And specifically, I study honeybees, but I'm really interested in all of our bees. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about both of those. Usually when people think about bees, their minds go directly to our honeybee. <clears throat> Honeybees are not native to the United States. They were evolved, they evolved in Europe and in Northern Africa, but they've been introduced and taken all over the world. Um, I think they've probably deserved their green card by now here. <laughs> they've been here hundreds of years. So they are one of the few social species of bees. They live in very large colonies with the queen and many uh, female attendant worker bees. And they're one of the few bees that we can harvest honey from. And that's why they've been taken all over the world. Um, but in fact, all of our bees are very important. And worldwide, there's over 20,000 species of bees. In North America, we have 4,000 species of bees. Most of these bees are solitary. They live all by themselves um, in the ground or in stems. Bumblebees are another social species, but their colonies are relatively small compared to honeybees. All of them are pollinators. All of them are beneficial. And in my mind, we need all of them. So as everybody's heard, probably, honeybees and other all of our other bees 
are in decline. And this particular diagram speaks to the problems with honeybees because we know the most, we know most about it because they're managed species. We can actually get into their colonies and observe their behaviors and try to understand what their problems are. <clears throat> and we think there's three main things. They're subject to a lot of pathogens and parasites. Uh, they run into a lot of pesticides and they have in some, in some places poor nutrition and the poor nutrition is simply due to lack of habitat. This whole effort that Fresh Energy is putting forth is about the nutrition aspect of that. But I would say, and I, I hope to show you in the few minutes that I have to speak with you, is that nutrition piece, providing bees with better nutrition, really will help their problems uh, with pesticides and with pathogens. So recently in my lab, we put together a quick newsletter and I don't, it's a lot of words, but I just wanted to go over this very briefly. I just added this in last minute because of the similarities between what's going on with people right now and the COVID virus and what we know about the pathogens, particularly viruses in honeybee colonies. So the similarity, similarity is a great teaching moment for everybody. So just as we are all learning to keep our uh, social distance of six feet for humans in order to not contact a virus, for honeybee colonies, that social distance would be about two miles, one to two miles, because honeybee colony on average forages two miles on every, when they go out to forage, they, go, they fly two miles. And so in order to keep them separate from each other and to not share viruses, we'd have to space them two miles apart every one. Two miles is 8,000 acres. That's their social distance, which is fascinating. Also, we need to take actions to protect our more, more vulnerable popula populations as we are doing as humans. We're learning that when bees forage, sometimes they deposit viruses on flowers or other pathogens. And it's not just honeybees, other bees have diseases too. And when they forage on the same flowers, they can have pathogen spillover or they can move their pathogens between one community and another, just like we can. So we have to be very mindful of that in our beekeeping. And finally, community healthcare measures are key to managing these disease outbreaks. For honeybees, they have what we call social immunity. In fact, they have socialized medicine. Um, that's not a political statement at all. It's just a fact in honeybee colonies because they're so highly social, they have ways to keep the colony healthy. They have this thing called hygienic behavior where they can remove diseased brood from the nest. They collect these medicinal resins that are very important. So I just thought I would bring that up as um, just to make bee health more relevant to all of us right now as we're all really concerned about our own health. And the reason we, of course, need to keep all our bees alive is because without any bees, this is kind of what our grocery produce sections would look like, and maybe they do right now anyway. I haven't been to the grocery store for a couple of weeks. I'm headed there after this, but without bees, even in the healthiest of times, our produce section, our fruits and vegetables would be very slim pickings. So while when bees pollinate, they provide really good nutritious food for us, but the flowers they're pollinating are providing really good nutritious food for them. And now again, I'm talking about all bees. The photo on the left is a honeybee. The photo on the right is a bumblebee foraging on a, a native plant. It could be native plant, could be non-native plant. The pollen that they're collecting and using for pollinate, to pollinate plants provides their protein and their lipids, the nectar is providing their carbohydrates. And it turns out there's value added plant chemicals in both nectar and in pollen that bolster the bee's immune systems and helps them detoxify pesticides. So for example, when we eat blueberries and blackberries and get antioxidants, those, that's the value added benefit I'm talking about right now. Those are the compounds that they're getting in, the bees are getting in pollen and nectar and they help their immune systems and they help them break down some pesticides, the toxicity for that. 
And that in a nutshell is why nutrition is so important for all bees. So we need more flowers for our bees and our butterflies and all of our beneficial insects that might feed on flowers to detox and restore their immune function. They also, honeybees in particular, need those resins that I referred to earlier and when I was talking about community healthcare measures. These are the compounds that we study in my lab currently. The plant resins, especially those from cottonwood trees in our area, are full of antimicrobial plant compounds that help fight off bacterial and fungal infections, even some viral infections. Honeybees collect these resins from trees and put it in the nest where we call it propolis. So propolis for human has a lot of medicinal value and we're learning the value of propolis for honeybee health too. So like I said, in our area, the honeybees are collecting most of those resins from cottonwood trees. And so it turns out it's not just flowers and it's not just flowering trees that bees need. They also need um, trees in the genus Populus to help them restore their health. They need those resins from those trees. So I know that Rob's gonna to get to this later, but I wanna really zoom out big and then I'll come back in. <clears throat> when we think about pollinator habitat, it's the connections that are so fascinating and so important. So as we plant more flowers to support the nutritional needs of our bees, it turns out we, we're doing so much more for our planet. When we put in native plants, their root structure helps soil quality it helps um, prevent soil erosion. And when you do those two things, then you're improving water quality. When you're preventing erosion into our waterways, we can improve water quality indirectly through good and well-placed pollinator habitat. And fixing that carbon in the ground ultimately helps with climate change. So especially in these times when we're all looking for what can we do, our problems seem so insurmountable and so huge. Doing small things like putting in pollinator gardens, pollinator habitat under solar arrays, or pollinator habitat in many places has these other benefits to improve soil, improve water, and help with climate change. That's why it's so cool that we can do small things and have big result in big changes. That pollinator habitat uh, can provide cover crops to nourish the soil, wildlife and bird habitat store, stores carbon in the soil, and all of these, like I said before. Which leads into more of what we're all thinking about, or I hope we're all thinking about, is regenerative agriculture. And it, how do we keep carbon in the soil, and how do we keep water in our soils. So putting in pollinator habitat helps with these bigger issues of how we help earth regenerate itself. So diversity is a greater goal. As we think about pollinator habitat, we wanna have diverse sets of flowers. We wanna have all kinds of diverse landscapes, diversity in our agricultural systems. When we do that, then we have diverse sources of nutrition, which is good for bee diets and it's good for our human diets. And then I just threw these in. <laughs> diverse cultures, diverse views are always good. Diversity in general is a greater goal. And again, here's our, some photos of our very, very diverse and gorgeous bees that we have. When we have lots of diverse and healthy bees, then it helps with floral diversity. Bees and flowers are co-evolved, they're mutualistic. When we have diverse bees, we have diverse flowers. Diverse flowers support lots of diverse bees. That leads to beauty in our environment and good nutrition for all of our bees. And of course, when we have floral diversity, plant diversity, it leads to nutritional diversity for us. All kinds of fruits and vegetables, and seeds and oils and coffee that's pollinated by all of our bees that give us this wonderful diet. And so I'll just end this end here by saying what we really need is good, clean bee food and lots of it and lots of diverse bee food. And I think that'll be a lead in for the rest of 
what you're going to talk about. Thank you so much, Marla. Sure. And um, I'll just direct everyone and encourage you to use the Q&A feature. We may not have time. We have a fairly tight hour. I know we got started a little late. Use the Q&A feature. We will be able to answer a lot of questions after the webinar today um, in a blog post and in social media. So with that, um, Michael, I will uh, I'll turn it over to you. Well, uh, thank you, Rob. It is um, my uh, great uh, privilege to uh, introduce the next speaker. I am uh, new to uh, bees and butterflies, uh, but I am an old timer on uh, studying uh, climate as a, uh, a lay practitioner, keeping track of the climate science. Since 1990, uh, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe has long been a hero of mine. She is one of the uh, chief authors and uh, expert reviewer on um, many, many, many papers, including the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fourth Assessment, also the U.S. Global Change Research Program, uh, National Academy of Sciences. Uh, she was a key author uh, on the National Climate Assessment. But uh, just to give you some uh, recent awards and recognitions, in 2014, Time Magazine uh, called Catherine Hayhoe one of the world's 100 most influential people. Uh, in 2017, Fortune Magazine called her one of the 50 world's greatest leaders. In 2018, a recognition uh, after my own heart in honor of the late, great Stephen Schneider. She was recognized as the Stephen Schneider Award for Outstanding Science Communications. And get this, in 2019, the United Nations recognized her as one of its champions of the earth. So uh, without further ado, a famous uh, climate scientist and uh, marvelous influential climate communicator, even to me more importantly, a climate communicator than a climate scientist, Catherine Hayhoe with her 155,000 Twitter followers. Uh, please, uh, please, uh, please welcome her uh, to uh, our uh, our webinar. Thanks so much, Catherine Hayo, for being here. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. I'm delighted to join you. Oh, yes. Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to pick up where Marla left off and talk about the connections between climate change and the issues that we're all concerned about, which are bees and energy. So let me just share my screen here. Just a second. All right. Here we go. Okay. The single best description, in my opinion, of climate change is the one that was given to it by the U.S. military. Yes, you heard that right. The idea that climate change is a threat multiplier in that it takes threats that already exist and makes them worse was originally coined by the Department of Defense. But I think it is the perfect description, not only of what climate change does, but why we care about it. Let me give you a few examples. This is a map of the number of billion dollar weather and climate disasters that occur around the United States every year. You can see Texas is number one, but every state gets multiple billion dollar events. And this is what, what we often think of as natural variability. We always have a chance of rolling a double six. A double six is a storm or a flood or a wildfire or a hurricane or a drought or a heat wave. That's part of life on this planet. But as the planet warms decade after decade, due to humans digging up and burning fossil fuels, that's about 75% of the problem, as well as due to land use change, deforestation and agriculture, that's 25% of the problem. Due to these changes, as the world warms, it's as if climate change is sneaking in decade by decade and taking one of these other numbers and turning it into a six. And then it takes another number and it turns it into a seven. And so all of a sudden we're rolling double sixes or even double sevens much more frequently than we should be. That is how climate change is affecting us in the places where we live. Let me give you a few examples. These are from the National Climate Assessment. So if you want more information, that's a great place to go. We see, first of all, that heavy rain, the one in 100 wettest days of the year, have increased already by 42% across the whole Midwest since the 1950s. And Minnesota has been particularly hard hit. As a result of increased flood risk in some places, people's personal home insurance has increased significantly. And in fact, a number of insurance organizations banded together a few years ago, and they decided to sue the city of Chicago and Cook County 
because they said that they had not adequately prepared for the impacts of climate change in increasing flood risk and the insurance companies were the ones who were left footing the bill. We also see that heat waves are increasing. It turned out that the heat wave season back in the 1960s was only three weeks long. The heat wave season now is almost 10 weeks long. And remember this fact because a brand new study that just came out about six weeks ago directly ties this to bee health and we'll get there towards the end. What else do we see? We also see, if you live along the West Coast, that atmospheric rivers, which are these rivers of water vapor in the sky that reach land and dump water, crazy floods, landslides, and more, they're getting more frequent and more severe. Along the Gulf Coast and up the Atlantic Coast, we're seeing that hurricanes are not more frequent, still the same numbers as we've seen for over 100 years. But because they're fed by warm ocean water and the oceans are warming, they're getting bigger and stronger and slower and they have a lot more rainfall associated with them today than they would have had 50 or 100 years ago. So just as an example, if you know anything about um, natural disasters in history, there was a devastating hurricane. In fact, it was the deadliest natural weather disaster in the United States that hit Galveston which is a small town just south of Houston on the Gulf of Mexico. It hit Galveston in 1900. So hurricanes, devastating hurricanes, are a normal and natural part of life on the Gulf Coast. But Hurricane Harvey that hit the exact same area, Galveston and the greater Houston area in 2017, Hurricane Harvey easily could have happened 100 years ago, but it's estimated that it had about 40% more rainfall associated with it today than it would have had if it had happened back at the turn of the century. So that's how climate change is a threat multiplier. In the case of hurricanes, it's not making them more frequent, but it's making them more damaging and more devastating. In the Western states, we know that wildfire is a normal part of life, right? It's a normal part of the ecosystem, but as the planet gets hotter and drier, when a wildfire starts, and most of them are human ignition anyways, when a wildfire starts today, it's likely to burn twice the area today than it would have 100 years ago. It's estimated that the area burned by wildfires because of the changing climate is more than double, that's the yellow plus the orange, it's more than double what it would have been without a change in climate. That's how it's acting like a threat multiplier. And then of course, it seems like a long time ago, but it was just a few months ago, the devastating wildfires in Australia, a billion animals killed, countless impacts on people's lives, their homes, their health. These wildfires were not anywhere near what any scientist expected until maybe the middle of the century. I was speaking to colleagues while this was happening, many of whom had been studying this for decades and they were devastated. They said, we knew it was getting worse, but we didn't realize it would get this bad this fast. Now, the topic that we're all thinking about today, what, what about the pandemic? Did climate change cause the pandemic? No, climate change did not cause the pandemic. But what is climate change? It is a threat multiplier. And in fact, air pollution comes from the same fossil fuels as are causing climate change. So burning fossil fuels itself is a threat multiplier. A study looking at SARS back 15 years ago found that if somebody lived in an area where air pollution from fossil fuels was very bad, they were twice as likely to die if they were caught SARS than if they lived somewhere where air pollution was good. And a brand new study from Harvard just came out last week, as you can see from the date here, showing that the same is true for coronavirus. People who live in more polluted areas, and here in the US, those people are some of the poorest people in the United States, those people are more vulnerable to the coronavirus than people who live in places with good air quality. If you wanna know more about the connections between climate change, um, the coronavirus pandemic and air quality, 
we have two global weirding episodes where we unpack this. And there's also an excellent interview that I strongly recommend by Dr. Ari Bernstein from Harvard. This is what it looks like here, where he really clearly draws the line, connects the dots between climate change, uh, habitat fragmentation, and air pollution. As the Prime Minister of Dominica said, he said, to deny climate change is to deny a truth that we have just lived. Why do we care about a changing climate? Because it exacerbates the risks that we already face today. But then we say, so surely if, if people just knew this, if people just knew the science, they change their minds, right? Well, I'm not going to get too far into this, but I have a lot of other talks I've given that could get into this if you're interested. But the bottom line is simply this. The answer is no. We have known the basic facts about climate change for over 100 years. We've known for 200 years that heat trapping gases control the temperature of our planet like a thermostat. We've known since the 1850s, over 150 years, that digging up and burning coal, and then later oil and gas, produce heat trapping gases. And we've known since the 1890s exactly how much the planet would warm the more and more of the stuff we burned. No, when we look at public opinion data, we see that people don't truly have a problem with the science. I know that they always say they do. It's just a natural cycle. It's the sun. They say that. But when we actually look at what they, what they respond to in public opinion, it is very illuminating. And this is what we see. Um, so these are all the different counties. You can see Minneapolis right up there at the top. These are all the different counties in the US. Anywhere that's orange, more than 50% of people would say yes to the question. The darker orange the color, the more people would say yes. So most people across the whole country would say yes, global warming is happening. And then when you say, is it caused by human activities, all of a sudden the numbers drop way down. Because the, not, the, the predictor of whether we agree with this statement is not how much we know about the science, it's simply where we fall in the political spectrum. So this maps pretty much one-to-one -one on people's political affiliations. But this is a much bigger problem. Again, look at that. So this is, do you agree with the science? This is, do you think it matters to you? It turns out that people who would say, yes, I 100% agree with the science, they don't think it matters to them. And if they don't think it matters to them, why would they think we need to do anything about it? And then there's one more map that's even darker blue, and it's this one. People who talk about it. It turns out we never talk about it. And if we never talk about it, why would we care, right? It's all connected. The biggest, one of the biggest myths we've bought into is the myth of psychological distance. The idea that climate change only matters to people or places who are far away. Future generations, but not us. People in developing countries, but not us. Polar bears, but not us. We don't think it matters to us. So that's why I truly believe the most dangerous myth that the largest number bought into is the idea that it doesn't matter to me. Because I could agree completely with the science, but if I don't think it matters, why would I ever do anything about it? The second most dangerous myth we've bought into is that whether I agree, not only that the science is real, but that the impacts are serious and that action is needed is simply where we fall on the political spectrum. But a thermometer does not give us a different answer depending on how we vote. We are all affected by a changing climate. So that's why I would expand on what I said here. And I would say the most dangerous myth is that we don't think it matters to me and we don't think there's anything we can do to fix it. So what is the solution? Interestingly, I believe that the problem gives us the solution. That's what I think. Let me show you. This is the problem, right? We don't talk about it. But I think that talking about it can actually be part of the solution. But not talking about it by disagreeing immediately, beginning the conversation with something that we agree on. 
And then once we've agreed on something that we already care about, connect the dots to how climate change affects what we already agree about. And then don't stop without talking about positive solutions that we can get on board with that are consistent and compatible with our values. And I wanna close by giving you a very specific application of this general template. What bonds us? What connects us? What is this webinar about? Be health. And we've known for a long time that climate change is a threat multiplier. How? It's affecting the habitat range of bees, which in turn affects their diet, as Marla explained. It's changing when they emerge in spring and potentially even throwing off their rhythms. And it's increasing the risk of disease. Now, I mentioned, remember when I was talking about heat waves, I mentioned a brand new study just came out a couple of weeks ago. In fact, two months ago now. This brand new study just came out that shows that increasing frequency of unusually hot days, which is one of the most significant ways that climate change is affecting our weather extremes around the whole mid-latitudes, it is what? It's increasing local extinction rates, it's reducing colonization and site occupancy, and it is decreasing species richness within a region. And it doesn't matter with whether what condition the land is in or not. Climate change is a threat multiplier. So here we've immediately bonded and connected, right? If you care about bees, then clearly you care about climate change. Why? Because you care about bees. See what I mean? It's who we already are, that's why we care. So what's a solution? Well, we know, oops, there we go. We know that there are solutions that are positive. And we also know though that we need energy. This is a very striking figure that shows the average life expectancy for a person in what was the most, one of the most developed countries in the world back 200 years ago, England and Wales. Our life expectancy has gone from 40 years to 80 years in just 200 years. And the number one reason for that is energy. The fact that the industrial revolution replaced massive amounts of human labor, animal labor. It replaced slave labor, which was absolutely essential. And it is the number one reason why we have a better quality life today. So when we see places where people live in energy poverty today, we often say, oh, well, they need to do it the same way we did. But people don't need to transport themselves in Model T Fords today. People don't need to use party line telephones today in the same way that people have leaped right over to use cell phones and new technology in the same way we are doing the same with energy. This is a map I saw a couple months ago that shows the area used for different functions. This should shock you if you haven't seen it already. And people often say, well, I know I've heard about solar energy, but it would take so much valuable space. Well, if I looked at this map, I've calculated that if we wanted to supply the entire country with electricity from only solar and nothing else, and of course we don't because we have plenty of wind and other sources too, but if we only wanted to do solar and we wanted to do the entire country, we would need an area roughly equivalent to the area currently devoted to maple syrup, you can see it up there in the Great Lakes region, over there by uh, Lake Erie, maple syrup, or if you look down in the, in the Carolinas, Gulf. So it, that area would be about this big. This is where I live in Lubbock, Texas. It would be a square area about this big. That is it. And here, if you're familiar with Texas, that's about six cotton farms, maybe a few more, but not too many. So I put this on Twitter and I actually found out that Elon Musk had done a similar calculation. I said, people worry about how much land we'd need to supply the US with clean energy. Well, Elon Musk and I have independently calculated it and we both came up with something roughly comparable to the area we currently use for maple syrup or golf, about 100 to 120 square miles per side. Much to my delight, he replied. He said, good, although a bit conservative. I don't think we need that much space. So the argument that it's too much space, first of all, 
is clearly not true. And I like his little comment here about the giant fusion reactor in the sky called the sun outputs a truly staggering amount of energy. But as fresh energy does, we can use that location of the solar panel installation to also build habitat at the same time. It's not a case of it can only be used for one thing. It actually offers the opportunity to be not a threat multiplier, but the exact opposite. Not only that, but solar energy grows enormous jobs. This is a, a review of the number of jobs in the electricity industry as of last year, and you can see solar's at the top. It's more than all fossil fuels put together. And globally, around the world, 2014, six years ago, was the year when new clean energy installations outpaced new fossil fuel installations. This was the year when the world was adding more clean energy than more coal, natural gas, and oil combined. And today we're up to about 70 to 30. 70% clean energy, 30% fossil fuels. And I love these pictures from a, a great program called Climate Visuals because they show where this is happening. It's happening in really unexpected places and ways that actually improve the quality of people's lives decrease air pollution, which makes us more susceptible to the coronavirus, and provide the energy that we need while not endangering habitat. So why do we care about climate change? Because of what we already care about. There are solutions that benefit all of us, bees, humans, and more. And the real bottom line is this, who we already are, what we already care about, makes us the perfect person to act. Thank you. And actually, Catherine, thank sure. you so much. Oh, so great. I'm, I'm, I'm in, um, I'm trying to make up a little ground here, Catherine. I think you and Marla are both around 3 million views for your TED Talks. I'm, I'm in the 20,000 range. We, we've got some, we've got we'll some work, work to do. <laughs> we'll work on it. <laughs> so um, in, in, in combining these things, um, I just want to share some information and ideas about where fresh energy plays in this space and how we think about maximizing all of the public benefits from these, uh, these two uh, concurrent challenges. And, um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll share some visuals here that I've uh, pulled together. So jumping off from where you left this, Catherine, we go out into space and we think about the invention, the American invention of satellites and, and really the powering of those satellites. But to power these satellites, you need an energy source that was reliable for years and years at a time. And, um, you know, batteries were just too heavy. So uh, we created this new technology called photovoltaic uh, or PV solar. It's the same kind that you and I find in camping equipment now and, and calculators and, and on rooftops. It, it doesn't create heat it actually directly converts that energy into electricity. Since the space race, there's just been an extraordinary breakthrough after year after year in declining prices and incremental improvement. And it's amazing what has happened in the falling price of photovoltaic solar. And this chart only goes up to 2016. Uh, and I think since 2016, the price has actually fallen an additional 65%. So it's gone from that tiny little slice to just uh, one third of that tiny, tiny little slice. Something happens now when, when something becomes cheaper and people think, oh, it's not just cheaper, it's also better. This is fantastic. Wow, this clean energy revolution, let's do it. And then they see a picture like this one from um, the California desert or the Arizona desert. And unfortunately, they think suddenly, what about maybe there's some negative trade-offs. Maybe, maybe we don't like the way this, this clean energy transition looks. So, so there really is a, a challenge in thinking about, will there be negative consequences? Will there be unintended consequences in transitioning to more use of clean and renewable energy? You know, we can do 100 square miles or 120 square miles. Unfortunately, that would involve an extraordinary amount of transmission lines as well, which are even harder to get built than a large scale solar farm. So we saw this transition happening in Minnesota 
and started asking questions. But we also started seeing that, that these designs, these solar projects were causing conflict. So we reached out and we started a little research project looking for agriculturally and ecologically compatible solar farms and really asking the question, you know, can we do this in a way that it doesn't give uh, that, that we can have it all that we don't they don't have to have a negative trade-off and we actually found a picture of this project west mill solar farm thankfully we have an example of what these projects can look like see in, in europe and in england the growth of the solar industry was on arable land unlike in the united states where it was mostly you know out in the california desert so after we found this project that showed we can do this the next question we asked as policymakers, we actually called Marla and we said, you know, we're going to get a couple thousand acres of solar period in Minnesota over a few years. And will it make any difference? You know, I mean, if it's not going to make any difference in the population of the bees, maybe it could help them around this one project. But if, if it's not going to make a difference, then maybe, maybe it's not worth doing. What we heard loud and clear was that city and state and the federal government is today not investing sufficient resources to keep these species alive, whether uh, sustaining a honeybee population or stabilizing it, or native bees like uh, bumblebees or monarchs, or, or even a lot of the native birds. Um, they all need healthy habitat to survive. And so we asked this question of like, well, what can constitute pollinator friendly? in the managed context of a solar farm. We're clearly not gonna to try to replace every blade of grass with a flower. So we need to have a robust conversation. But then, you know, in, in thinking this through, Michael and I realized there's a pretty big incentive to just plant a five by five garden in front of a thousand acres of gravel or turf grass, and then call the whole thing pollinator friendly. There's an unfortunate incentive to do something called greenwashing. And then negatively, it directly influences public perception of solar and whether it's seen as trustworthy or untrustworthy. We wanted to make sure that entomologists and the experts that knew what's good for bees were engaged early on so that these could be credible. So getting started means doing something meaningful, but likely also incremental. And that's where this policy tool called a pollinator friendly solar scorecard comes in. So we worked with Marla and her colleague at the time, Dr. Karen Oberhauser. Um, Karen has now moved over to the Arboretum at the University of Wisconsin to be closer to her grandkid, but uh, Karen is one of the world's foremost experts on mo the uh, monarch butterflies. In partnership with, uh, with Minnesota leaders, including Audubon, Minnesota, the Corn Growers of Minnesota, uh, Xerxes Society, the Board of Water and Soil Resources, and uh, uh, Farmers Union, we designed a policy tool that's very easy to use. And it means that what's being done within the context of that solar farm is credible. Since this, this policy passed into law um, called the Pollinator Friendly Solar Act in, in 2016, it has now been adopted by uh, nearly a, a dozen additional states. So this sets the standard in terms of what constitutes a incremental but meaningful benefit to bees within the context of a solar farm. So it's really a standard that ensures that there's flexibility so that the projects aren't, aren't spiked and killed and they're too expensive, but um, also ensures that there's a real benefit at scale to bees. Um, it's kind of fun. It's, you know, I think we all grew up with these ads so from Kit Kat bars of combining two things, you know, the peanut butter and the chocolate and how these two things can be better together. So then we started to see projects uh, like this one by Minnesota Power, this one out in Vermont with uh, Be the Change, um, here back in Minnesota with Minnesota Native Landscapes, project that was designed by Prairie Restoration. Um, project here you can see from one year to the next, uh, this is project by NG, and this is beautiful. Uh, this is in the Dairyland portfolio of projects, um, absolutely gorgeous. Now, you'll see a lot of Black Eyed Susans in the pictures that I share, because it's an early successional species. So over time, these projects and these landscapes change. So you'll see different kinds of flowers. It won't just be yellow and black. Um, it'll be more and more color, uh, like this project in Vermont by uh, NG and Encore Renewables, and um, this one by Denison University 
and uh, AEP. This is just uh, a gorgeous, gorgeous site in Ohio. So uh, University of Dayton did an extraordinary job with theirs. This is right after the panels went in and uh, a year later. There's really an extraordinary opportunity simply by asking for pollinator-friendly solar, not just low-cost solar. Um, ask for low-cost and what's growing under and around the panels. Maryland has done a great job at this stormwater, uh, stormwater plant. And uh, President Carter, President Jimmy Carter's solar farm was recently reseeded uh, by uh, Ernst Conservation Seeds and Fish and Wildlife and Soul America uh, to be pollinator friendly. This is down in Plains, Georgia. So clearly this, is, this seems like, well, maybe this is just like a nice cute little thing this is real uh, significant business and a huge opportunity because global energy leaders like Enel Green Power and NG, who would both have huge operations worldwide, uh, see this as an innovative uh, and exciting approach in doing photovoltaic solar development and really maximizing the productive use of the land under and around the panel. Um, additionally, uh, smaller, more nimble, agile companies, including Eden Renewables, One Energy Renewables, Encore, Pinegate, Sun Tribe, Namaste Solar, Sun Common, Innovatus, IPS Solar, Solar America, SunShare, uh, Solar Energy Systems, Community Energy, and C2 are doing this at scale. So if you're not doing this because you care about the bees um, or because you care about what your customers want, um, solar developers should be doing this because there's lots and lots of competition in this market. And you'll get lots as a, as a company buying uh, electricity, whether you're a city or a corporation, um, there's, there's lots of competition for your business. So there's also utilities that are really uh, strong leaders on this, including Connexus Energy, whose beautiful project was uh, first came across in 2015. Um, Connect, uh, Excel Energy, who is requiring every bid their solar procurement to include a pollinator-friendly solar scorecard, as well as Southern Municipal Power Company and NCE Clean Energy in California. Alliance uh, Energy and Dairyland Power in Wisconsin and Iowa also have pollinator-friendly solar projects in their portfolio today. So this is really being done at scale. Utilities uh, and uh, universities love it. Uh, it makes them look good. And not only that, but corporations love it. Cliff Bar's pollinator-friendly solar farms in Iowa as well as in Idaho are going to be absolutely gorgeous. And they are just such strong supporters of this movement of stacking benefits. It's amazing because you, you can't have Cliff Bar's unless you have pollinators. And as a company, they treat energy like an ingredient. So they're saying, hey, we want the clean energy that goes right into our food to be something that moms think about when they're thinking about what they're giving to their kids. And I certainly think about when I um, think about what I'm giving to my kids. But it's not just about pollinators as well. As Marla said, this is also about sequestering additional carbon down into the soil. And these uh, pollinator-friendly plants and flowers uh, significantly improve the, the performance uh, they capture that intense stormwater coming off of the panels, and they drive it down into the aquifer while holding the soil on site and improving it over time. These projects can actually have significant functional benefits. Fresh Energy is collaborating closely with the National Renewable Energy Lab, Enel, NG, and several other partners on projects nationwide in more than 20 states to explore and, and document the functional performance benefits of uh, more robust uh, pollinator-friendly landscapes. And in fact, creating a cooler microclimate can positively influence the output from the photovoltaic solar. On some of these projects, like this one down in Arizona, they're seeing more than a 15-degree cooling effect under the panels. And that's really exciting, particularly for the Western states that have that intense sun. And another thing, it's not just about the bees, it's also about these fantastic sheep. So when you do regenerative and rotational grazing, you're sequestering more carbon as well. These two things are not in competition with one, with, with one another. The sheep can be grazed in a way so that they still allow for the pollinators to benefit from the habitat. It's all about how they're grazed, whether it's conservation grazing or continuous grazing, which basically results in like a, a golf course. And it's not just the sheep, it's also the beekeepers. Marla is a beekeeper. And I, I have such an admiration for your story, Marla, of like, you know, before you got into bees, I think you, you said something about, you know, actually having to go and get stung so that you would make sure that this is a, a field you wanted to get involved in. The keepers that I've partnered with, they've told me 
you know you're not really a beekeeper until you get stung in the nose. And I'm not quite ready to make that kind of level of commitment, but it is great to know that these pollinator-friendly solar farms can provide habitat at scale, uh, like uh, the honey beehives that are on the pollinator-friendly solar farms for Cliff Bar and the Cliff Family Winery. And they're actually now selling this solar-grown honey from their website today. Um, so I know, Catherine, it's not maple syrup, but it's another sweet inducement to get you excited about a clean energy future. And, and just to bring it back to the things that bring us all together, you know, clean energy is great, flowers are great, uh, bees are great. Let's talk about beer, Catherine. Let's talk about beer. <laughs> so we need to get some of this down to you, but this is by 56 Brewing here in Minnesota. And we've not just partnered with 56 um, on this beer, but we've worked with Alchemist Brewing out in Vermont and several other breweries around the United States to use honey from flowering solar farms 100% clean energy and exciting uh, ingredients that really create an opportunity for convening conversation, bringing people together for conversations around solutions, not just for the climate, but also for pollinators. And uh, it's amazing how much more creative we can all get uh, when we have uh, a, another beer. So uh, that's, that's my presentation. I'm so grateful for uh, all of your time. Um, I think, I know that we're just a touch over, we might have time for one question for each of our, our guests, and then we'll take all of the rest of the questions. Please put them into the, the Q&A and the chat, and we will be sure to get to them on, uh, on social media uh, within a day or so. If, if I may, I've already been busy writing the answers to all my questions. There are a ton of questions for you and Marla. So I would love it personally, if you guys don't mind taking another five minutes, just run down a few of the questions in the Q&A for you guys about bees, because I want to hear the answers too. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Marla, can you see the Q&A? Do you want to? Uh, I just filled in. I saw that Catherine was already on it. So I, <laughs> I answered a couple of the questions. Um, I'll, let me take this one about, are there barriers related to pollinator plantings and the wanting to use only native species? So, and then there was another question, I'm going to kind of roll it into one. What about these postage stamp gardens? You know, if you can only put a little bit. So I don't, the, the barriers, if you're doing it in your home, there's none, except if you live in an area where they have a covenant against certain plantings <laughs> um, that the barriers if you want to put it on your corporate head pollinator plantings on your corporate headquarters or around um, solar panels there's not really any barriers there's a lot of land preparation you have to prepare the site so that you don't get a lot of weeds so there is a learning curve to putting in pollinator habitat and then once you put it in, it needs to be maintained so that it doesn't get um, overgrown by weedy species. All of those um, installation maintenance, there's a lot of information now on different websites. Our state, our uh, state agency, the Board of Water and Soil Resources, we call it Bowser, has an amazing site on, and I'll try to, when I get back into the questions, I'll link it on how to do pollinator habitat. As far as native and non-native species, it's good to get native species back in the ground as much as possible. Um, if, if you have non-native species, um, those are not allowed in some of the uh, federal mixes, the CRP mixes, but locally you can do those too as long as they're not super invasive. And I think I'll stop there because for time. There's a question in the comments. Uh, so Fresh Energy is based in Minnesota. Um, but because of our success in pollinate, passing the Pollinator Friendly Solar Act in 2016, we were invited to work with allies out in, um, in Maryland, and then invited up to Vermont, and then invited down to South Carolina. So we, we now have um, this area of our work is a national, has a national reach. So I, I work with uh, allies and colleagues from Vermont to Oregon, uh, to Southern California, to Florida, uh, to Texas, uh, so if you go to beeslovesolar.org, um, then you can find a shortcut to all of the pollinator-friendly solar scorecards for the variety of different states and more information. There's also 
a lot of information about how to. Um, so we really didn't get into that here on like, how do you do the seed? How do you prep the soil? You know, what's the biggest uh, challenges? And um, that is, has been addressed in our previous webinars, which are available on beeslovesolar.org and will be addressed as well. If you're also concerned about uh, our questions about the policy, there is an upcoming webinar run by the Clean Energy States Alliance on May 5th, and uh, a link to the registration for that webinar will be in the follow-up email. This uh, session was all recorded. We'll send it to you all, and so we'll send you information about that May 5th uh, webinar as well. Uh, the big two things to look for is get the lower edge of the panels up to, you know, 32 inches, 36 inches. In the UK, they're doing just one meter. Um, and there's a really good uh, ROI on doing that. You need to get them away from the mowers. <laughs> mowers and solar panels don't go together so well. Um, so, um, Marla, is there another uh, pollinator question you'd like to take? Oh, there's, I didn't. <laughs> Um, I don't want to take up too much time skimming. I was just listening mostly. Do you, any of you others see any questions? Um, I, Marla, I, could you? Go ahead. There was Jeff. actually a lot of questions, I think, about kind of the, the blend of plants. I mean, there was a question where um, there's apple and cherry orchards and they're hoping, hoping to plant, but local entomologists were not encouraging. They said that there's a more well-rounded collection of plants that you need. Um, and then other people are asking, you know, what about the mix of native plants versus others? Um, how, if you could just speak to that generally. Um. Okay, so if you're talking, it depends what bees you're talking about, but if you're talking about honeybees, remember that they fly on average two miles and up to five miles for food. So it depends how big your farm is and the local farmers. If you have cherry trees and apple trees, and then, you know, there's all uh, kinds of other flowering plants on roadsides and ditches and around, then the bees and honeybees and all of our wild bees will have plenty of food throughout the season. If you go to almonds in the middle, in the Central Valley of California, where it's a million acres of almonds and nothing else, it's true that there's not enough flowers out. There are not enough, uh, are not enough flowers to support any bees as soon as the almonds stop blooming. So it depends on the size of your farm and um, whether, whether that habitat will support bees year round and what they have access to apart from cherries and almonds when they bloom. I'm a big mixture of natives and non-natives. My front yard is full of only natives. I burned off the lawn, I plant only native species. My backyard, I have more some non-natives that I kind of like. It depends, clovers, alfalfas, um, other cover crops, buckwheat, um, canola, some of these may not be native. The clovers are not native to the U.S., but they're amazing bee food for all bees. So it just kind of depends. I'm not really strict on those rules. I think it's kind of like the U.S. There's natives, there's non-natives. We need to pay attention more to our native communities <laughs> and encourage them, but um, can you make decisions? No, we have, we need all of the good flowers and good bees that we can get. So maybe then last question, this relates to a few things people ask. Um, so for example, where can they find more information? So Rob, you already mentioned a bunch of webinars. Marla, you mentioned the solar farm pollinator assessment. Is there an easy place where someone could just go and say, I live here, here's a list of the plants, here's the assessment, what would you recommend? Xerxes. <laughs> Xer, -E I'll put it in later. Xerces dot org. They are a native uh, invertebrate conservation organization, and they have a huge pollinator program. If you go on Xerces dot org and you click on pollinators, you can find maps. And you can find all the information you need about putting in native species. I will also link our Bowser, our Board of Water, Soil and Resources, because they also have amazing resources on how you can do everything from put in a flowering lawn, a bee lawn we call them, to huge uh, meadows and ha larger habitats. It's, it's, really, it's really true. It's important that we should all plant our own pollinator gardens in our front or our backyards. And also, we should ask not just 
for clean renewable energy. But we should ask what characteristics that energy has, what kind of land use is it employing. So uh, it's important that if you uh, work for a company or an organization or a school or a municipality, that you ask for pollinator friendly solar or you require all of your bids to disclose information about what's growing under and around the panel. So, um, you know, we can all do individual things and by expressing our buying preferences, um, we can do those, we can create habitat at scale. Today in the United States, there's 300,000 acres of ground mount solar, 300,000 acres today. But by 2030, we will have more than 3 million acres of ground mount solar. That's a fantastic thing for farmers because they will get land lease revenue from all those projects. But it's a huge opportunity for bees um, because the vast majority of all those acres can be way better than bare ground or gravel or turf grass. Um, with incremental improvements in those landscapes, we can have it all. Really want to thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Marla. Thank you, Michael. And thank you all for joining us. We'll get the, web, uh, the recording and the uh, resources together and organized, as well as additional questions uh, answered to the questions posted in the, in the Q&A and the chat. Thank you all for your time today. Have a great rest of your day.